So red ink, what is it? It's the words of Jesus. Anytime if you have a red ink edition Bible, you open it up, your Bible will have the red ink inside it. That's the words of Jesus. And that's where we're going here in the month of November. We're looking at Jesus' words and what he has to say to us. He's speaking in a unique way through parables to us. There's a reason behind that. and We're going to look at that here today as we talk about the kingdom of seeds. You may ever, maybe never thought of the kingdom of God as a kingdom of seeds, but that's one of his parables that he gives us today. And I'm going to start in a different fashion. I'm going to show you how Jesus intended you to hear this because we read it like, you know, like a book, but the reality is this was a live action time with his apostles and with people in the streets, and he would share something and then he would give the answer later in private. And so you need to start to find the background of that, and the background of it is found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. We're going to look at that, but if you've never heard this, this is worth writing down. If you read the Gospels as if they're all the same, just a different version of what happened, you miss a very important ingredient. Matthew is his perspective through the Holy Spirit is Jesus as the Messiah and the King. It's very different than the other three Gospels. Mark is, is Jesus as the Messiah and the suffering servant. Luke is Jesus as the Messiah and his humanity, that he's the Son of Man. John writes Jesus is the Messiah and he's the Son of God. Those different perspectives tilt the gospel that you're in, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, to a very important perspective. So you always have to remember when you're in Matthew, it's the Messiah and the King. So he's teaching about his kingdom here, all right? Let's look at verses 34 and 35 in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open up my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Oh, don't you love it when you're getting inside information, something that's been hidden? Right up to this point, this is Jesus connecting with the prophet Daniel in many ways, who was told to seal up certain truths until a proper time. Jesus is the proper time of the truth to be revealed. But that's not the one who he's quoting from here. It's actually Psalm 78, verses 1 and 2. And so keep your finger there in Matthew. Let me read to you what the psalmist... Most of us never picture the psalmist, besides David writing the psalms, the psalmist Asaph, he music minister, that he is also a prophet because we just learned that from the Gospel of Matthew. In verses 1 and 2, it won't be on the screen, it says, My people... Hear my teachings. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. That's the prophecy by Asaph, the music minister that writes many of the Psalms in the book of Psalms also. And that's what's being quoted in Matthew chapter 13. A word that's been hidden for a season, for a purpose. So let's talk about the hidden truths that you're going to look at today. Jesus' teaching in parables was part of a plan. This was a plan you could see he didn't come up on his own in this. He is fulfilling his plan. He did it to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. So he is dotting every I, crossing every T. If you haven't heard this, you need to know this. When Jesus came, he did what? He fulfilled every prophecy about his first coming, literally. And so you could see Psalm 78, it literally said he would speak in parables. He's fulfilling that prophecy right there number two he spoke in parables in order to conceal deeper truths many thought that he spoke in parables because he just was giving great pictures 
that you could see it more because, you know, I remember a picture of when you're talking about a farmer or when you're talking about a merchant and different things and you're telling a story that people would remember it. But no, he spoke in parables for a deeper reason because he was concealing deeper truth. What's that all about? What deeper truth would Jesus want to conceal? Why wouldn't he want to make it plain to everyone? That's what today's message is all about. Number three, parables are truths not found in the Old Testament teachings. They were hidden for a proper time and purpose. The amazing thing about the New Testament, everything in the New Testament you can usually trace back to somewhere through a thread of Scripture in the Old Testament, except for the parables. The parables Jesus is giving is the hidden truth that the prophet Asaph talked about, a hidden truth that was for a time and a season that the world was ready to hear the truth they needed to know. Now, the truth actually deals with certain things. A parable is, is an allegory. Now, in our day and time, if you go to any Christian university today, they could possibly get this wrong. Many are saying that the Bible is all allegory. That's not true. It always spells out when it is an allegory. It says, like something, or as something, or this is a parable. Why is the Christian universities and schools around the world starting to change that? It was prophesied that there would be a great falling away that there would be something before Jesus returned the second time that would mark that we're in that season, and it's called the apostate. They will fall away from the truth of this word. So they make it all like a mystery, like you can't understand it. It's all an allegory. Not true. Most of the Bible is literal, unless it says, like this, as that, or a parable, or here's a song, and it tells you it's a song. And so it spells out where it's different, all the other places you can trust for it to be literal. Wow, pretty interesting stuff. Let's get into two parables that he's talking about, because they're parables of the seeds. Why do we need to know that? You're going to see as it unfolds, because the seeds represent his word. We're in Matthew chapter 13. We started in verses 34 and 35. We're going back now to verses 3 through 9. Matthew chapter 13, 3 through 9. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others, hmm, this is the good one, still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If you have an ear, would you... Uh, Raise your hand. Do you have an ear? Anybody got an ear? You're not even sure if you have an ear or hear this one. How many would not raise their hand if I asked you any question this morning? Okay. This parable, this is the parable, and he's going to explain it here in, in just a little bit. Okay. And, uh, but let's look beneath the parable. Beneath the parable... Whoever has ears, let them hear. Whoever is in tune with God will hear. This phrase, how interesting, God loves sevens, doesn't he? That's his complete number. This phrase is used seven times in this gospel. It's also used seven times in Revelation to the churches of Revelation. So seven times to the churches when Jesus is speaking in the book of Revelation, let those who have ears hear. Let them hear. What he's saying here is there's something more than just hearing. He's going to go on, and and in this next passage that we're not going to be reading, we're going to go and actually go to the explanation that he gives of this parable. He goes on to tell his disciples what he's really trying to say, that there's more to hearing. If you hear something, 
Do you know what you heard? Did you understand it? Did you apply what you understood? See, some can just hear, you know, when you're listening, you go, ah, okay, I hear them, but do I understand what's going on? And if I understand it, can I take it and can I add it to my life that it changes how I think and how I act? That's the meaning behind this parable of the sowing of the seeds. Number two, only those who have spiritual discernment will grasp the deeper insights of these truths. Now, here's the good news. If you go, you know what? I remember these insights. I know these things. That means the Spirit of God has shown you some insights that His Spirit speaks to your spirit and gives you wisdom in these areas. So through this very familiar parable, you're supposed to be encouraged. I understand this. I got this one. That's a good thing to be able to say. The third thing is, Jesus' communication style is on purpose for two reasons in this. I'm going to explain the one right here. The parable was given in public, but the explanation was in private. He did not want those that would pervert what he was saying to understand. Isn't that interesting? Who would pervert the word of God? Was it for that day and time, or was it for this season where the Word of God has been perverted, added to, or taken away from in many different ways? So what season? That actually happens in every season. There are always people that want to add to the Word of God or take away. And so he did not give the explanation in public. All right, let's jump to the explanation of this parable that he gives here. It's found in verses 18 through 23. This is the parable, and these are the words of Jesus. He's explaining it to his disciples, what's going on, okay? Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. That's when you see in the parable it was a bird. The birds are symbolic here of demonic spirits, evil ones that are snatching away the word from their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to some who hear the word and at once receive it with joy. They hear it and they received it with joy. But what goes on then? Well, you'd think that it would be a great thing because now they've received it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed fallen among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed fallen on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces. See, if you hear it and understand it, you're applying, you're producing something. A crop yielding 100, 60, or 30 times that what was sown. Okay. Kingdom seeds. I'm going to give you five things that... that in here that you should have caught by this. The seed that's being planted in these soils, the seed represents the hidden truth, the hidden truth of God's word, okay? So the seed that's being sown. Number two, the bird's an evil one, wants to pervert your understanding, so he snatches the truth away. So you wonder, you go, why do some people hear God's word and they go, oh, there's a demonic force that wants to snatch the truth from people's lives. Number three, those without roots, they know the word of God. It, it actually says they can have joy is what it is, but they didn't use it in their decision-making process. They weren't rooted in it. They could know it and go, oh, I learned that in Sunday school. Oh, I heard that in church. I knew that, but they didn't apply it. Therefore, trouble defeats them very easily. Number four, the thorns are the things that either prick or poke us painfully in our emotions. Hmm. Have you ever said, God, I'm holding on to this scripture. 
I'm holding on to this. I remember it. I'm glad it now seems almost like another lifetime ago. When my mom and dad were divorced, I believed that God would protect me because that the sins of the forefathers wouldn't come into my life. It seems like uh, another life ago that all of a sudden I found myself as a divorced man. And I was like, whoa. The emotions and all that. Wait a minute, God. Your word said that the sins of the forefathers wouldn't visit my generation. What's going on here? Well, everyone still has a free will. And so I found myself several decades back as a divorced man. Not a happy place to be. But you know what? I didn't let that deter what God said. I knew that in time, God would show how things, all things work together for good. Wow, can divorce even work together for good? Can death work together for good? Can sorrow and, and bankruptcy and all these other, can they work together for good? Well, this is why he puts this one in here, I believe, because he talks about including the deceitfulness of wealth. We think, well, if, if we got money, we can make it through anything. Not true. These worries choke the word of God in a person's life. So important that when things come, and if you're not rooted in what? In Christ. Rooted in Him. That God, I may not fully understand your word, but I trust you. I don't know how this, why I'm going through whatever season, but I trust you that you'll get through those times and you won't be deceived by whatever's going on. Doesn't mean it's going to be fun. Doesn't mean that it's not going to have pain. I love number five, though. Good soil represents those that hear and understand and bear good fruit from the Word of God. In my last church that I pastored for almost 10 years, I was amazed when a couple said to us, we have a group that's going out to lunch today, and we want you and Mindy to come to lunch with us. And I said, okay, uh, sure. So we ate in the back room of a Mexican restaurant, and they said, do you know why we wanted you here today? And I said, Nope, because you wanted us to have good Mexican food? No. We wanted you to see the fruit. You've always wondered, why did God allow you to go through a divorce? We're all divorced people, and we're in your church today because we know you know the pain and that you'll continue to guide us through this. And I went, so you came to church because we're divorced? Now, I was the only one divorced. Mindy's husband, uh, she went through the, the death of a marriage through the death of a spouse. I went through the death of a marriage through divorce. We both experienced the death. Both were painful. But God turned it around that people said, I want to hear what this pastor and what this couple has to say because they know what it means to be a blended family. They know what it means to be a stepmom and a stepdad. They know what it means to have that whole new makeshift of things. And God allowed something to be produced. Now, when you put a seed in the ground, something doesn't come up right away. I'm a city boy from Philadelphia, but I learned this little bit. If you put a seed in the ground, you have to water it. God has to bring the sunshine to it and all the rest. You've got to keep the weeds away. But in time, it will produce, and that's what this parable says. In time, you'll produce 160 or 30 times. Wow. I don't know how that plays out in Kingdom Edition, but I know that I like this about Matthew. He sees Jesus as the king. He says, when you start producing, you're going to get first, he says, 100 times. He starts there. If you don't get 100 times, you're going to get 60 times. Fruit-bearing aspects. Things that money can't buy. Influence and changing people's lives. Or you'll get at least a minimum of 30 times. Now, in the natural, if I said to you, give us your money and we guarantee you at least 30 times back, we would have people lined up blocks and blocks and blocks to get 30 times back. This is the promise that God wants to give you, no matter what you're facing, that this is the return when you trust Him and you trust His Word. All right, one other parable. It's a short parable, but it goes with this because it's the planting of the seeds. And it's found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Jesus told them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds, or in some translation tells you what the weed was, what was sowed, tares. Weeds or tares were sown among the wheat and went away. That evil enemy did that, right? When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds or tares also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in a bundle to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Now, he's going to give the explanation again in private, but I wanted to pause and let you catch something here. He's telling you what's being sown. The wheat is the, that which is the harvest. It's, it's that which is going to bring life. It's that which is the new. But within this, the tares. Here's a statement that I wanted to give you in this. Those who distort the word of God by adding or removing to it are poisoning the hearer. The tares in this culture, if they didn't separate when they harvest the wheat, if they didn't separate the tares, the tares itself was poisonous. If it was in the bread, it kills you. Are you catching that? And so what it's telling you is that when God is putting something good in your life, the devil wants to sow something that will poison you at the same time. The question is, are you a poisoned Christian? Or have you been able to discern and hear, understand, and produce a good crop, and you didn't get lured by the poison? We live in a culture today that's poisoning the world. The culture says that you can have same-sex marriage. It's poisoning the Word of God. God says that it's a marriage between a man and a woman. It's a covenant together. The world is, is poisoning every aspect, and the devil is sowing more and more tares today than he ever has, and many Christians are confused. Let's see how Jesus answers the answer to this parable. It's the insight that you need to go home with. This is what we're giving in closing here now, okay? We pick it up here. It's down in verse 36. The parable of the weeds or the tares is explained. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds or the tares in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. He's talking about himself. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. What's the harvest? It's the end of the age. This is very important. And the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Whoever has ears, let them understand. Whoever has ears, let them more than understand. Let them apply it to their life and bear good fruit. If you were to take time, this parable and these parables of the sowing of the seed is done in three of the Gospels. Let me encourage you. Find what it says in the others. The other three, here's the three Gospels that the parable of the sowing of the seed, it's found in Matthew, Mark and Luke, they're called the Synoptic Gospels. You'll find other little details that are worth insight. Let God guide you this week in how you can produce a spiritual life by trusting what you hear, understanding it. It's going to go on and tell you how to accept it, how to let it become a part that it grows inside you. That's how the production comes out. 
But in closing here, let me give you the parable of what I see in the spiritual realm. This is the parable of the holy and the unholy. The unholy looks a lot like the holy. They're planting their seeds, aren't they? They're trying to get a harvest also. So number one, the one who sowed the good seed is always Jesus in both parables. If there's anything good being sown, it's Jesus. You say, well, I'm not sure where this is coming from. It's coming from Jesus, the good. The field or the ground is the world and the hearts of humanity. That's what the, the field or the ground represents. Some hearts are what? They're hard, rocked, rocky hearts. Some are thorny hearts where they, all the deceitfulness take of it. They're not rooted and it chokes them off. Number three, the good soil or seeds, interesting, he actually calls the ground and in this parable, the seed as good people, people of the kingdom. It's the only place where you're promised to return. When you have good soil and good seed, you get a good return. If you have good soil, bad seed, not a good return. If you have any other combination other than good soil, good seed, you will not get the good return. This is the maturation process of being a Christian. Number three, the weeds or the tares are lies and the puppets of the evil one. There are so many lies out there. And in the name of love today, Christians are told we have to accept so many things because God is love. Let me tell you, God is love. But he's not the human love that you're hearing about. It's an agape, a holy love, not an unholy love. Love is not a ticket to do any sowing any seeds that you want. If you're not sowing seeds that are good God word seeds and in good soil, you are reaping a harvest unto death. And that's what number five is. One harvest goes to destruction. The other goes to life. These are so important things. I wanted to wet your whistle as we start this month of November to prepare you so that you would hear things that you could apply to your life, that you could start judging your own life. Do I let bad things be planted in my emotions? Do I let bad things be planted into my mind, my thinking? Do then I harvest good things when those bad things are planted in my emotions, in my heart, in my mind? Can I reap something good? No. It has to be good soil and good seeds. We have to guard our hearts. We have to be willing to let God plant within. Trust me, He is planting greater in this time, in the end age, than He ever has good seed in the people's lives so that you could have answers for your children, answers for your neighbors, answers for society, answers for the culture. We're not hate mongers. We just love a good harvest. Amen.